Hey guys, Kevin Ismay for the Knicks, season 2, episode 3, the best with the best to get the best. I'm sorry I took so long to review this episode. I'll tell you guys the main reason why it took me so long. Mainly because of Cinemax, and I'm gonna blame it on this because I think this is really stupid. You guys know how Cinemax always puts out mini recaps for, like, the episode. I always use that recap and then expand upon it. That's how I usually, like, do my recaps, um, because you guys know I recap this show. But I do use their recaps. They had the recap for next week's episode up, and the reason I took so long to review is because everything that was happening in that episode that they said was happening wasn't happening. I'm like, okay, am I missing something here? What's going on? I then realized that they updated it, and that was a recap for next week's episode, so now I know stuff that's going to happen next week, um, but whatever. Nevertheless, this was a great episode, as usual. I thought this was by far the best episode of the three. I thought this was a really great episode overall. Some really interesting stuff going on this episode, I have to say. Definitely really loved what was going on this episode, even though I know where we're headed next week. I think this episode was amazing, and I definitely really loved it, and uh, let's just get into it because, as usual, there's a lot to talk about. Basically, we see right away that, as we know, Kate told John about that ritual um, that she performs, and he does exactly that. He injects himself with heroin, takes cocaine, basically puts into a power and then a powder and then injects it. Basically, you know, because she told him about it, you gotta have the proper doses, so that's what he decides to do. And you can tell that this is kind of cathartic for John, because, you know, he always thought this was a problem, but this is really helping him out because... You know, it's, it's, he's, he's able to do this without, you know, some bad happening. I do feel this is going to eventually, um, have some sort of, you know, impact. It's going to be a negative impact, not a positive impact. So Bertie's with a bunch of men being told about procedures and conditions at the hospital. And he has actually left the Nick. We weren't sure if he was going to, but he has left the Nick. And, uh, this hospital is much stricter than the Nick. They're not like the Nick at all. They, uh... Just, you know, just from the beginning, we find out right away they don't want to call him Birdie. They want to call him Chickering. They can only call him Birdie in his off hours, since they are a lot more formal there than the Nick. So, you can tell that Birdie is basically just trying to do what he usually does. He's trying to throw his opinion on things, telling him he's not Jewish, but he worked on them recently and he learned a little lit Yiddish. They then talk about Birdie's gift for lab work, and they tell him he will assist Dr. Guggenheim to search for gland extract, and Birdie says he wasn't aware of it, and they explain to him a little bit about it. They call it adrenaline, and he dismisses them and tells them there will be a second meeting, which Birdie wasn't aware of, and, you know, you can just tell that Birdie isn't really aware of what's going on here, and I definitely like seeing Birdie, you know, a little, um, very vulnerable. I mean, Birdie keeps getting screwed over. He's at this hospital, which, is, by the way, is called Mount Sinai. That's the hospital he's at, and uh, just really interesting stuff here. So he then meets with this woman. Um, Esther is her real name, which uh, I really like this woman. I hope we see more of her. In fact, I think that she'd be a great romantic interest for Birdie. You know how he's been trying to get Lucy. I think that, you know, this woman is a very good love interest for him, even though we do see something in the episode that I will talk about. Basically, she talks to him about how he says that he's, um, you know, basically he asks if he looks lost, and she says he looks more disappointed, he asks if Zimberg noticed, and she says he concealed it well, and, you know, because, you know, he hit it very well, and he says he's letting him know he's going to have to earn his way into the operating room and letting them know he's going to have to ease him into the fold, and she says he's a very deliberate man, and he asks if that's why he has her take notes at meetings, and she gets very upset, thinking he means that she couldn't possibly be a surgeon like him, and he says he just meant and apologizes, but she laughs and says she's not a surgeon. This woman is very um, funny, definitely. She's very funny, she's very witty, and you can tell that Birdie is not as aware or kind of is kind of, you know, lost and kind of slow with her, which I definitely like seeing. Um, she tells him she's not a surgeon, she's not even a nurse. She's actually writing a story about Zimberg for Collier's, and she asks if that's more surprising than being a surgeon, and he asks if she's the girl that went undercover for the article about sanitarium lun uh, lunatic asylums, Genevieve Everidge, and uh, she asks if he wants to meet her, and he says he just imagines she's a very exciting person to talk to, and she says she is, especially when she's taken down and sets up a day with him at 7, and uh, Genevieve Everidge is an alias. That's not her real name. You know, she has another name. Her real name is Esther, but I like that we found she's Genevieve Everidge, and she's very spontaneous because right in there she sets up a date with him, which uh, I thought was really cool. I definitely like that. So Cornelia talks to Algernon about Spate's empty coffin, and she says even Cleary was speechless when he opened the coffin. And Algernon asks if she's certain it was the correct grave, which I think is a good question. I mean, how does she know if she wants the right one? And she says she can read a headstone. He says it's very odd. She says it's like someone knew. And by the way, 
The way you describe Algernon Cornelia is simply that. Very, very odd. What's going on between them is very odd, and I really like that. So he says it's very odd. She says it's like someone knew there would be people looking for Spate and wanting to make certain he couldn't be found. And he says they obviously wanted her to leave this alone, and so does he. And she says Spate didn't just drunkenly fall overboard, which, yeah, there's no way he just drunkenly fall fell. There's more there, and she can't give up now, and he says she can. If someone wanted him dead, it's a matter of the police, not her. And he tells her she's being reckless again. They kiss, and he says they can't do that here or now, and she asks when. You can tell right away she wants to get back into this romance. She clearly still has feelings for him, but he kind of doesn't want to do that, and I think it definitely is very interesting. So, Gallinger is with Eleanor, who is supposedly back to her normal self. She's talking again. She can do everything for herself now. It's very interesting to see. We don't really know, you know, maybe Dorothy's help. I mean, she pretty much thinks that she's back to normal. And uh, she says that she should be down. She should lie down and, and give herself strength. And she can help Dorothy make lunch later. Dorothy goes to Gallinger, though, and uh, who says she's praying for her, since the family certainly doesn't want to have her locked away for good. They've basically made her think that she's better. She's not better, though. However, what she is, you know, she tells him that what she is now is not acceptable to them or anyone, and she says she's a baby killer and a mad woman, facts known, not just in New York anymore. He has, she's talking about Philadelphia, and she says Ethel's fiancé broke off their engagement. They're not living in hope like some pathetic spinster, and I like what she's saying. You know, they can't just keep having this hope. They need to look at things realistically. Gallinger clearly is not. He is just that in love with Eleanor that he can't accept that she's kind of crazy. And Gallinger says she will get better. Dorothy says they're all hoping, but she knows Eleanor wouldn't want her collapse to affect her the way it has. And uh, it's really sad because you want things to go off. As much as I don't like Gallinger, you know, as much as we know that Gallinger is, you know, this racist guy, that was how it was back then. You know, other than that, Gallinger, I feel really bad for him because this is his wife who he clearly very much cares about. But he can't accept that she has the condition that she has, and I can understand why he can't accept that, because he loves her that much. But it's really sad overall, and I hope that she does get better. So, Lucy meets with Henry, and this was great with Henry and Lucy. I love this. He says she knows how to bring a charm to the sick men and brighten their day. She asks if he's referring to a comatose patient since one of the men was delirious of morphine and the rest were asleep. He says he brightens her day, clearly trying to get, you know, he's basically trying to ask her out here. He asks if she believes him. She says she's holding the full bed pen, so it's hard to believe. And then he realizes, he says she's a quick and clever girl and he likes that, but he wants her to stop being clever and give him a chance. And she says there's no shortage of girls who aren't quick and clever, all hired by him, who have already given him a chance. And she's basically just telling him, just, just leave me alone. I don't want anything to do with you. He says she's the one that has him intrigued as long as she doesn't have a man already. He says her hesitation makes him think no, which means he won't stop chasing her. This was just, this was great. I love this. And especially in such a dark show, it's fun that we had some, I like that we had something really fun here. She asks if he believes in God, reads the Bible, goes to church and lands Christian life. And since he hesitates, she says no and tells him to stop giving up the chase. So I'm thinking that Henry's going to try to get some sort of religious help. That's what I'm thinking is going happen here because clearly he likes Lucy clearly he's trying to chase her he's not going to give up he's probably going to try to get some religious help and turn to AD although I don't know if that's a good idea we'll, we'll get into AD later because he by far is a crazy stuff Lucy by far is some of the crazy stuff in this episode so John gets a call about someone that is uh, this girl um, Clara she's died from a heroin injection and he wants to see the body. He wants to test on this body. And her parents refuse. Of course, you know, he's trying to find a cure. So he's seeing if he can find a cure here. But her parents are refusing since the rest of the family doesn't know about her addiction and thinks she died of the flu. And of course, what John is asking to do is obviously very irrational. I mean, who would just want to give their daughter away just to have her tested on by some man that they don't even know. I mean, obviously, wouldn't make a lot of sense to do that. I can totally understand why they didn't really want John to do that. I mean, again, why would they want to give their daughter away? Nobody would want to do something like that, and I can understand why they didn't want to either. It would just make perfect sense for that. But John tells them that he's trying to save girls like their daughter with his work, and their daughter isn't the only person in the family that has a problem. They as much have as much interest in finding a cure as he does, and... I do agree with that. I like how John's trying to get them to relate to what he's doing. He says they help him with perhaps what he learned, and he will help them. He'll work as hard as he can, and they can bury her in a few days. They agree as long as he doesn't cut her face, and he says that he'll be extra careful, and it seems like they have a deal there. So clearly is, clearly is with Cornelia and Whitting, who, again, wants the money, and... 
you do see that Cleary is just telling him, I'm not going to be able to get you this money. You're going to have to wait. And Cleary assures him that Cornelia will get him the money. And he says, you know, he makes it known that if Cornelia does not get him that money, he's going to have to get another lawyer. Because again, Whitting needs that money, obviously. And Whitting, I don't think, is a bad lawyer by any means. He just needs that money because obviously he wants to be paid. I mean, you don't sign up to be a lawyer and not want to get money. He needs money. He's not doing this for his health. He's doing this because he wants money. As good as a lawyer as he can be and as much as he cares about Harriet, that's why. So Harriet's brought to the courtroom, and you think this is for the trial. That's what you think this is for. Harriet says she didn't have to come, and she says she should have come sooner, and she's here now. They get ready for the trial, and the judge starts the trial, and we realize that they're actually at a pre-trial hearing that Whitting is asked for. And I think what Whitting says is very good here. He shows him paperwork from 16 cases that were thrown out due to proven entrapments. And the judge says they have no relevance to this case. And Whitting says all cases show uncommon similarities to the wrongly accused citizens like Harriet. And the judge says to not tell him what to do. He recites a hymn and he says the devil will not influence his decision. He, she has shown the true murderous nature of her people. He will use the courtroom and the strength of his God to sound a warning against people now flooding their shores and let people know exactly what they are. And he tells them the trial will commence on the 15th and that's that. That he's not going to listen to this lawyer. Which again would make sense. You know, the judge knows what he's doing. He's not going to listen to his word over, you know, um, the lawyers. So... Cleary asked what the fuck just happened, you know, he really thought this was gonna go well, and it didn't at all, so I really felt bad for Cleary here, he keeps getting screwed over. So, Dorothy does Eleanor's hair, and this is the first sign that probably Eleanor's not better, you know, she's not better here, you can just tell in this scene she's not, she doesn't like it, she doesn't like her hair at all, Gallinger says it looks lovely, Dorothy says she can start again, she asks if she's alright, Eleanor says she just wants everything to be alright for him, he always used to show her off to his classmates, and now she's afraid... There's not much left to brag about, and that's understandable. I mean, they've been through a lot, and he tells her she will always be the most beautiful girl in the world to him. Again, you can tell he really is trying to ignore her flaws because of how much he loves her. He just loves her that much that he can't accept that there is something wrong with her. There clearly is something wrong with her, but he just doesn't want to, you know, admit that there is. That's how much he loves her. So, she says she has lost so much weight, and her dress will be hanging off of her, and she's very pale. He says, just a class reunion with a few men and their wives, and, uh, I mean, again, he's trying to make it seem like it's not that bad, and she, and some are even their cousin, and she asks what she even says to them, that she's recently been locked away, and at dinner, what if one of her teeth come loose? So, Gallinger is then at the reunion, and he meets some students he used to work with who are all happily married, and they ask the Eleanor. Basically, you can tell she has not come because he makes up this lie that she's gone to see relatives in Long Island, and she he she assure he assures them that she will be back. And then this scene was very interesting. He overhears a conversation um, talking about the problems of people that deviate from the common man, and the biggest problem they have are basically everything that like Hitler had in the Holocaust. You know, like gays, um, gypsies, and the biggest being for lack of a better term, Negroes. That's what they called them back then. I'm not trying to be racist. I'm just saying that's what they called them back then. Um, they talk about how they're the biggest problem of weak intellect and innate lack of character. And if they continue to breed and mix in with them, they will forfeit potential greatness for monolization of their species. And they talk about how things like the Holocaust are inevitable. That's what's going to happen. And they, that is the future. And that's true. That is the future. But the biggest thing is, is Gallinger really okay with this? I mean, we know that he has, you know, discriminated against Algernon so much. But does he really hate, you know, um, black people so much that he would just wipe out them in a genocide? Would he really do something like that? I'm not really sure. And I think that's something very interesting that the episode introduced. And you really see Gallinger trying to struggle with this throughout the rest of the episode. And I definitely think it's a very interesting topic that they are going to tackle more and more as the season goes on. I think it's something that Gallinger himself is thinking. You know, he's thinking, do I really hate them that much to do something like that? I don't know if he, I don't know if he really hates them as much as his colleagues do. And I think it definitely is very interesting the way the episode brought that up. So, AD is at a seminar, and this was by far the craziest scene of the episode. Well, definitely, well, the scene after this is the craziest scene. AD is at a seminar, and a man confesses all of his sins to him. He says, God will forgive him, and he asks who else needs a sin, and Lucy confesses about her sins, which you can tell that AD is clearly upset about, but he doesn't visually show it. He just says, go on, cricket. That's all he says. He's like, go on, and uh, you can tell that he's really upset, but he's trying to hold it back. 
So Birdie and Esther go to a restaurant for their date. And again, I love these two. I really do. I think they are great together. Uh, he says he can't believe she's never been there before. He asks how she'll be able to gather all the information she did without anyone becoming suspicious. And she says it was seduction. However, she laughs and says she actually paid them off. She has if he liked the article. He says he did, but he doesn't want to increase omens and things like that since psychiatry is a very new field and things always look worse at the beginning. And she says it's not always. And they watch two conjoined twins play violin. Okay, <laughs> I mean, that's that was freak shows were popular then. Um, but uh, basically, she says that's why she's writing about Zimberg, a positive story about a uh, Jew, and uh, he's met, he's met that's not, you know, he that's not suffering. And she says that she is too, but it's not catching him. He says it's just, it's just Genevieve Everidge is not a Jewish name and scream schoolgirl, but she might not be that way, and no one knows, and she doesn't want them to. She says when you read Genevieve Everidge, she is everything you want her to be. And she doubts that anyone would feel the same way about her, and he says that he would. And uh, I think it's very interesting. You can tell that she is basically two steps ahead of him. You can just tell that. I mean, he clearly does understand her, but she definitely is more aware of what's going on. Because obviously it's her it's her story. She knows what she's doing. He doesn't. It's, it's really interesting. So Cornelia comes home. Philip says he's very lucky to have her. And I think this is the first sign that Cornelia honestly might not be in love with Philip. I think you very much see that in this scene. It's just, it's very interesting. So she says he's always so sweet to her. He says he does like to be with her, however, infrequent. And I like that word that he says, you know, infrequent, because they're fr un they're not together a lot, honestly. They're not. I mean, they're married, but they're barely ever together. And she says she should be more intensive. They kiss, undress each other. They have sex, and what's interesting that I read about this is that women in the 19th century that were supposed to be like Cornelia, or, you know, that were considered good women, weren't supposed to enjoy sex. They didn't like it very much. So when Cornelia says she liked it, that's very interesting. Um, he asked her if he should petition to ask if she feels pregnant, and he asked how she would know, and she says she worked at the hospital. She says she went and saw Harriet today. He asked why she would do that, and she says she's her friend, and the judge was brutal, and her lawyer cost them more than she could afford. She was hoping they could help her, and Philip doesn't want anything to do with this. You know, she says she doesn't deserve sympathy, and Cornelia didn't know about the abortion. He says to stay away from her because only God can save her now, and he clearly doesn't want anything to do to help her. He doesn't want to help her at all, um, which again is understandable, but I think this really shows how different these two really are. I mean, Cornelia feels that she should be helped, while Philip sees her as essentially the devil. That's how he sees her, as does everyone, and I think it's just very interesting to see Cornelia here, and Algernon seems to understand why she's doing this. You know, he seems to kind of understand her. I think it's the first sign that Cornelia and Philip are not very compatible. As good of a man that Philip is, Cornelia is not the good girl that Philip thinks she is, and I think that definitely is very interesting. Just these little things that she does is very different than what the common women did then, and I really like that. So, John goes to see Kate, and they both take the cocaine and heroin. Then they have sex. He then goes to see Abby, and uh, Abigail's back in this episode, which I love seeing Abby, I have to say. I mean, it's always great to see her. Um, but we get a lot with her here. And again, this was one of the parts of that recap that was throwing me off, because I'm like, why is this not happening? Oh, because that's the next episode. <laughs> I mean, it was it was really annoying. Don't don't go on Cinemax.com um, until, you know, I guess, I guess till they update it, because they've updated now, but if you guys went on there, you know, when you're watching the episode and you know what was going on, I feel really bad for you, because that was next week's episode. So John asks her how she's feeling, and she says she's having muscle spasms and insomnia, and the headaches are much worse. He says she should have come to see him, and she asks what's for the... By the way, her nose is completely healed, like her nose is better. And she asks what for, there's no cure, and they both know where she's headed. You know, she probably is going to die, and Lucy is with AD. And holy shit, this scene. I mean, I thought AD was a good father to Lucy... That might not be true after this episode. I mean, honestly, A.D., you can tell is a man that's very devoted to religion, and uh, there are certain things, of course, that the Bible does show. There are certain things that the Bible shows, and there are certain things that someone should follow, but she confessed her sins, and, you know, when you confess your sins, that's supposed to be like, you know, that's just the, God has forgiven you for confessing your sins. However, A.D., you can tell, is not happy about her at all. You know, she said she confessed her sins while she was up there. She honestly could feel forgiveness squash over her. She felt lighter, safer, and felt free. And he says she's far from free, and the sins he feels are disgusting and humiliating. And she says she had to confess, and she says it just like God back into her arms. He says God won't forgive her. He not only made herself look foolish, she not only made 
made herself look foolish. She made him look worse. And she says she, she didn't mean to. He, he yells at her. He says she didn't mean to, but she still took drugs and fucked a stranger. I get his point here that he is a concerned father, that she, you know, maybe should have thought more about what she was doing. I understand that. But people make mistakes, and that's what AD needs to realize. People make mistakes. Not everyone's going to be perfect, and he needs to understand that. And, you know, he didn't yell at this man. Yes, I get that that was just a random stranger, and this was his own daughter. He never thought his own daughter would do this sort of thing. But come on, just be a bit more, have some sort have some compassion. Like seriously, just have some compassion. Get what she did and move on from it. It's really that simple. And I felt really bad um with what she was going through, I have to say. Definitely I felt very bad for her. So overall, you know, I felt very bad for her here. And then it gets even crazier because he talks about how dumb she he says he knew she should have known from that day she was born, how dumb she was. He grabs her turns her over, hits her, smacks her, and says he calls her cricket because she sounds like one every time she speaks. He She makes his skin crawl, and tonight it took the power of God not to squash her while she was confessing. She begs him to stop. He says she's going to make it worse, and he beats her with a belt. I mean, that was insane, and uh, I don't know what's going to happen there, but holy shit, that was insane when he beat her. I mean, I didn't expect that to happen, but, um, Guggenheim and Birdie then start their research, and he asks about Birdie's encounter with Esther, how Birdie's encounter with Esther was, and he says she's like, no one he's met before, but he's worried that he's no, excuse me, he's worried that he's no match for her. We again see that, excuse me, we again see how Birdie is, um, tested at this hospital, because he talks about, you know, if they should test on something other than rabbits, and Guggenheim says they need to start with rabbits and work their way up, and Guggenheim asks what he means by no match for her. And what he says is very interesting. He says he's worried he's not experienced enough for her. You know, she's just gone through a lot more than he has. And that's why, you know, he can't really relate to what she's going through. And despite what his family, and I thought that was definitely very interesting that we saw that. I hope things work out well for them because I like these two. But if Birdie really is that worried, I mean, things could go really bad here. So despite what his family said, Henry gives out his check to the company running the subway, even though his father deliberately told him not to. Like, he said, please don't do this. This is really stupid. And, uh, you know, basically... He tells him he agrees to the partnership. He says he has been able to find some savings for the company that he felt would be put to better use elsewhere. And he asks if it's be if it's uh, better than reinvesting. He says his father doesn't know and he would like to keep it that way. And if he wants to stay in the 19th century, that his business, that's his business and toast to theirs. And it seems like they're going to have this business now, even though his father said not to. I just find that all very interesting. I mean, you thought that Henry was a better man than that, but no. And I, I like that Henry is rebelling against his father. I mean, who is his father to say what he can do? If he has the money, if he can do it, he should let him do it, even though he doesn't want his father to know about it. And he's probably going to find out and it's going to be really bad, but we'll have to see what happens with that. So Algernon performs a liver surgery, Him and, Gall and him and Gallinger are clashing over what to do, and Gallinger realizes he wants him to perform the surgery, and you know, sooner or later Gallinger's gonna realize why this is happening, because why would Algernon want someone who deliberately has, you know, um, tormented him emotionally, and even though, you know, Algernon said we need to move past this, why would he want to do this? And uh, I definitely think that Gallinger is going to start wondering about what's going to happen between John and Algernon, especially this next scene with John, because he approaches John, um, you know, John basically approaches Algernon, and Gallinger asks John why he chooses Algernon over him, and John says something for which he's better suited for. He says it was him that saved, that saved him, and John says he's very grateful, his pre he's appreciation for him, and, but ever since Algernon has started, he has improved. And he says, if he wants to collaborate with him, then jealousy won't serve him as well as ambition and efforts. And uh, basically, John tells out, and I thought that was definitely very interesting. I mean, you can tell that John does care about Gallinger. It's just Algernon's more capable of doing what they're doing, and he's worked longer with him. So definitely very interesting stuff there. So John tells Algernon their enemy is syphilis... Um, Spirochet, and their goal is to kill it. And Algernon asked how he proposed to do that. And John says he read that several syphilis patients have tremendously improved. The only link to them was all the suffering under various other illnesses. So Algernon says that the belief is that this syphilis is another illness, and he says it's not at all. He tried to find a kill for it. It died, and on its own, 
And one night, one night, since basically he realizes that syphilis can be killed by temperature, and he asks how high, and he says 106 or 107. And of course, that's very risky. I mean, if you have more than 107 degree fever, you're probably going to die. I mean, that's not the most, you know, safest thing to do. He says he's talking about lethal temperature. He says it's a cure to a lethal disease, and he says to induce the fever using something curable like malaria, a deadly disease inducing terribly high fever with a relatively fair cure, and he says to try it. He says the risks are enormous, and John says he doesn't have time for it. Algernon asks who it's for, and John says it's for Abby, and he tells him how bad her condition is. He asks where they can start, and he says where they usually do with a pig. So, Barrow is then with this man. This was very interesting. He's with this man who's basically helping him with construction, and he's actually caught during construction, and someone suspects he's responsible for Bunky's death, and Fester, who he formerly called Jimmy, he doesn't want him to call him that anymore, he wants him to call him Fester, he says he needs him to come to Tammany Hall and confess what he's doing, and that definitely is very interesting. So, Maze. Let's talk about Maze. Um, this scene, again, was very interesting because something happens to Maze in the next episode. I'm not going to talk about what it is, but I'm like, oh shit, it's going to happen here. It didn't happen. So again, it really confused me. Maze tells Barrow he has enough backers to bring him into an interview for membership, and he will help him out, and uh, basically that's what's going to happen there. So at the bar, Junia, I really felt bad for Barrow in this next scene with Junia. I love this next scene here. Junia's flirting with many men. He's upset that he hasn't been first in line, and he asks what's so special about her. She asks if he's jealous, and she says to make her do it that way, you know, that they make her do it that way, and he says he's not an idiot. He's well aware this is a job for her. He just thought they would be more than just a sale, and, uh... She says he is. When he goes to sleep at night, she thinks of his sweet smile and dreams of his hugs and kisses. And she says when she wakes, she counts the hours until she sees him again. He knows she does. And uh, she says she wishes she could be with him all the time. She's trapped there, and he's all she has a life with him as she dreams of. And she says she's sorry, and he tells her not to be. It's not her fault, and she ended up there. And, you know, she asks if, and he asks if that's really what she wants, and she says she wants it more than anything in the world, and he says then that's what she will have, and she will have that, and I think that definitely is going to be interesting to see if that actually works out. So, Cleary gets his fighter back in the ring, of course, you know, that fighter that was very weak, and right, it seems like he's good, he seems like he's fighting again, but then he passes out, and he tries to get him to wake up. And I don't know if this fighter was drugged or something, but that definitely is very interesting, the way that he was good and then he wasn't. I don't really know what's going on there. So again, someone is really trying to screw over Cleary. And again, I really feel the person that, you know, is, is set up this match is the same person that killed Bunky. We'll have to see what happens with that, though. So John and Algernon test the fever on the pig. Cleary then brings in Clara's body, and they begin to test on her. And then we get the last scene in this episode, which by far was the most interesting thing here. Because, of course, we could tell that Algernon did not want to start this relation with Cornelia. He was trying to throw her off at all costs. We thought it was because of Philip, but that might not be the case because of this next scene. Algernon gets a call that he's very shocked, and this girl, Opal, has returned from Europe, who apparently is his wife. What? We've never heard about her before. They kiss, and his parents are there, obviously not knowing what's going on. His mom is saying they finally get to meet her after hearing about her for five months, and I love how his mom is pretending that they know her. She says it's been so long. She says she went to the Smithsonian thing he would be there, but came there straight away because she's family, and she's also a mess after all the traveling. They show her where to go, and Algernon's mom then slaps him, asks who the hell she is, and she says that, basically says that she is his wife, like, as she says. She's his father, she is, and his father says that's not something you just forget. But yeah, that's true. You don't forget um, marrying someone. And it, it was actually quite a funny scene, or I have to say. Um, and basically, he says she should have told, he should have told them and asked why he would lie. He says it happened so fast, they were in Paris, medicine was going so well, people were accepting them. He was happy, but then, and his mom says there's always a but then, but he is hot, he is hot, then he runs cold, and he runs and runs, and he says she doesn't even know what she wants, and, uh... His mom says she knows exactly, he knows, she knows exactly what she's determined, and she asks what she missed, and that's how the episode ends. So, what does Old Paul want? I'm thinking money. Old Paul wants money, um, you know, because why else would she go randomly come back? She clearly probably wants some money, or something like that. We'll have to see what happens with that, but that definitely is going to be very interesting to see exactly what she wants. Because, again, we don't really know what Old Paul wants, and uh, it's going to be interesting to see what she does want. Um... So that's going to be interesting. 
Let's talk about John and uh, this patient, Claire, Claire. It seems like this is something he's going to be doing, bringing in people to test on them. Is this going to work out? Is his theory going to work out? We'll have to see, because obviously he's trying to find a cure. We'll have to see really what he decides to do here. This is going to be very interesting. Lucy and AD, holy shit, I don't know what's going to happen there. Um, things are going to be very interesting between Lucy and AD. Lucy needs to get out of there. She needs to tell someone about this immediately, because obviously AD should not be hitting her. Um, so I'll see what happens with that. Uh, Barrow telling Tammany Hall, how are they going to react to what he's been doing? I mean, he's been doing things against, you know, what they've been saying, so we'll have to see what's going to happen with that. Is Junia sincere in her word? I mean, I feel like she is, but there's a part of me that feels like I don't know if Junia is sincere, so we'll have to see what happens with that. And also, because of this whole pig thing, is the same cure going to work on Abby like it did on the pig? We'll have to see. Hopefully it does. I'm hoping it does, but... Gallinger and, uh, you know, get, first of all, Gallinger and John is going to be very interesting because clearly Gallinger is jealous of Algernon and we'll have to see what happens with that. Does he really hate Algernon that much to have a whole genocide? I'm not really sure. Uh, but Dorothy and Gallinger, you know, that's just so sad. Hopefully she gets better, but I don't think she's going to. Uh, Birdie and uh, Esther, do you think he's overthinking this? I feel like he's kind of overthinking this. I feel like he needs to um, kind of just, you know, understand what's going on and just try to be more understanding of what's happening with her. I really do hope these two get together because I like them, and I'm hoping for their sake things do work out for them. We'll have to see what happens there. And then, of course, Cleary. What's going on with his fighter? Why he just randomly pass out? We'll have to see. But overall, guys, amazing episode. Really loving this season. Sorry it took me so long to review this episode, but I will see you guys in my next video, which will be for... Probably the originals. I think it's going to be for the originals, and I will see you guys for that. Okay, bye.